Here we go. It's black for my view. All right. Um, I see it. You can't see it? Yes. Although we, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so is, is anyone not seeing the first slide of my presentation now? We're seeing it. Good, good. Got a lot of technical problems. Okay, if I flip through a couple, can you guys see them changing? And nothing's changing or changing them. Uh, how about now? Now they are. Okay. It might just be, I think there's a little bit of lag, so I'll make sure I don't go through slides too quickly. Okay, so just a quick introduction. Uh, and if, if there's any problems or you guys are seeing the wrong slide or you can't hear me, just let me know, okay? All right, so um, yeah, so Alan gave a little bit of introduction. So we're part of a, a large team that's developing um, tools for assessing student cybersecurity knowledge. So I'll just give you guys a little bit of background on myself. My name's Seth Polson. Um, so I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Illinois and my advisor's uh, Dr. Herman. So I'm really excited about all sorts of different problems in education um, and how we can do a better job educating uh, computer scientists and mathematicians in general. Um, and so that's that's kind of me and Dr. Herman focus the kind of education people on the team, and Dr. Sherman and some of the others on the team are more of the cybersecurity experts. So we put some education experts and some cybersecurity experts together to make uh, education tools for cybersecurity. Um, was someone trying to say something? Some of the audio is garbled. All right, I'm still, it sounds like someone's trying to say something, but the audio is not coming through to me properly. Oh, the beeps are people joining? Okay, got it. Okay, I'll go back to... Um... Okay, so I just need to convince you as I'm sure, being the cyber defense lab, that we need to have a workforce that has a really good understanding of cybersecurity. And this is pretty evident. It's, it's fairly often we see things about companies that have these big security vulnerabilities and lose tons of customers or lose tons of money or whatever. So, and there's actually a, lots of evidence that there's a big shortage in cybersecurity um, professionals in the US. And so kind of the goal is, of the project is can we create better educational methods um, to more effectively train cybersecurity professionals? So just to like a little bit of background on research for you guys. So a lot of what we're trying to do with education research is that we're trying to put into practice evidence-based teaching methods. So um, for a long time um, in medicine, for example, people used methods in medicines that were not evident at all. Um, like this uh, picture that I have here is shows the theory of the four humors. So this is like back in the dark ages theory that people have four humors in them. Um, so all of the medical back then were based on these four humors, even though there was no scientific evidence for this. And kind of around the time of the Renaissance, people started using evidence-based medicine instead, which is where we scientific studies to make sure that medicin medicinal treatments were we choose if we use them. So we, we take a similar approach to education. A lot of times people kind of just um, that are the teaching methods that were used on them, 
or maybe just because their friends do teach that way. And so that's how people decide what to teach. But um, if we're going to do a good job educating our future generations, we, we should be doing better than that. So we should actually be using science to discover what are better ways of teaching people. In order to kind of, in order to be able to uh, see what the better ways of teaching people are, we need to have some way of measuring what people have learned. Um, and so that's really what the focus of this project has been, is creating that measuring tool. So if we have a good assessment, so we can measure what students have learned, then we can start to compare different teaching methods against one another and see how effective they are. Um, so in order to have a, a good assessment, we want it to kind of be broadly accepted. And we also want it to be a, a valid assessment. So we want it to be able to be a good measurement of what the student's knowledge is. And we'll kind of, so as we go forward in the talk, I'm gonna give you guys kind of some more background about how we developed the assessment. And then I'm gonna tell you about what sorts of statistical measurements we do to make sure that it actually is a good measurement of student knowledge. Um, so questions kind of so far on what I've talked about or should I just keep going? I think you're good to go. Okay, I can't see the chat at the same time as I see my slides, so yeah, anyway. Um, so there's these things called concept inventories that have um, started to kind of gain traction in the education community as being of student knowledge. So there's kind of some pictures of physics on the right hand side because the first concept inventory that was created was the force concept inventory. Force concept inventory is uh, a really good measurement that was created um, that helps measure students' knowledge of Newtonian physics. And this created a good way to kind of let instructors compare teaching practices. And it's kind of credited with, it came out about uh, 25 or 30 years ago, and it's kind of credited with um, kind of starting a revolution in physics education where people were able to use much better instructional practices because they could test them against each other by measuring their student knowledge using the force concept inventory. And so in kind of the last 10 years, people have started creating concept inventories in computer science. There's now the CS1 concept inventory that tests, that measures student knowledge of CS1. There's a data structures one, and there's a digital logic one. And then our team has been creating them for cybersecurity. So usually um, concept inventories are multiple choice, um, just to allow for uh, kind of consistent student knowledge. Um, because you kind of take the human grading factor out of it and make it con the grading consistent. Um, and they're supposed to be conceptual understanding questions. Um, and so the idea is kind of if you have more conceptual questions, you'll do a better job measuring students' knowledge than if you have um, non-conceptual questions. And concept inventories like to focus on the core concepts of whatever topic they're trying to measure so that they can kind of be like the common denominator, like if a student took a class in cybersecurity, they should know this sort of baseline knowledge. Um, yeah. So on our team, we've been developing the cybersecurity concept inventory and the cybersecurity curriculum assessment. So these these two these two assessments. Um, and so the process for developing these are first we want to kind of we we want to talk to experts and decide which topics we should be covering. Because if we're going to create a test to measure student knowledge of cybersecurity, we want to me make sure we're actually measuring the things that instructors care about teaching. Um, and so the team first kind of, so this is before I joined the team, but they did a lot of work talking to experts and writing the questions and discovering uh, what sorts of topics do cybersecurity professionals, or sorry, do cybersecurity instructors want to be assessing their students on. Um, and so this is kind of a result of the research. These are kind of the topics that ended up on the cybersecurity concept inventory. So these are kind of, from talking to experts, what our team decided were core concepts in cybersecurity that, that we should be talking about. Um, so in each of the questions on the cybersecurity curriculum, sorry, cybersecurity concept inventory, um, has kind of a scenario and then a question about the scenario and then these multiple choice answers about 
uh, that are the answer choices for the student. So this is kind of like what one question looks like on the test, and there's 25 of them. So I'll just give you guys a minute to, to look through it, but we'll, we'll look at a couple more questions in more detail later on. So what we did after creating the, the cybersecurity concept inventory, and again, this was, was surveyed experts just to double check and kind of make sure that the test questions were testing what the cybersecurity instructors wanted to test. And we found that um, the majority of the instructors that we surveyed were very happy with kind of the, the concept coverage. Um, and so the next step uh, after making sure that we were testing the correct things was to make sure that we were doing a good job testing those things. So one of the multiple choice questions is that you want to have a really good distractors. So you want the alternative answer choices to correspond to commonly held misconceptions that students have because you want those, you want those alternative uh, answer choices to be very enticing to students. And so one of the ways that, we, that the team uh, found good distractors was to interview students and try to understand what sort of misconceptions students have about cybersecurity. And so these were kind of like some main themes from those interviews is that students often conflate, conflate multiple things. For example, students conflate threat with risk. Um, students also conflate um, authentication with authorization. I'm sure that's something you guys have seen people be confused about because it's very common for people to confuse authorization and authentication. People also use lots of overgeneralization. So people think encryption solves every problem ever, which is pretty funny. Um, and people have this bias that, so people have this bias that, um, like if you have some software solution, it's going to be better than a physical solution, even if the physical solution was actually a better solution. Um, yeah, and so, so these are kind of the main misconceptions. So when we created the multiple choice options for the test, we used misconceptions to inform the alternative answers to make them very enticing. And that way we could make sure that only students who truly understand the concept would get the correct answer. And that's that helps us measure student knowledge with greater precision. So this kind of last step of the uh, cybersecurity curriculum inventory um, development is where I came in when I joined the team last year is um, administering the exam to a larger number of students so that we could do some statistical testing in order to ensure that it really was a good measurement of student knowledge. So there's kind of, a, so here, do them one by one. So there's a few different things we want to measure when we're doing statistical analysis of, of an assessment. So we want to make sure that it's a reliable measurement. So if a student took the same assessment multiple times, they should get the same, uh, roughly the same score. So what that means is that the assessment's actually measuring their knowledge. It's not just like random. Um, another thing is we want to measure the difficulty of the questions. We want to understand what the difficulty of the different questions on the exam are because we want to have a range of difficulties on the test. Discrimination is another thing we want to measure. We want to measure the discrimination is if a question does a good job differentiating between students of lower and Level. And that also is something that helps us measure student knowledge with greater precision and with less error. Uh, so there's kind of two main psychometric frameworks we use. They're classical test theory and item response theory. I'm not going to get like super deep into what the differences between them are, but these are the frameworks we used. And these are very accepted in the education research community as being good frameworks for, for kind of analyzing the goodness properties of assessments. Um, so kind of some, some kind of broad overview data of the tests. So during the pilot testing, so the Cronenbach Alpha is a reliability measure. And so uh, 0.78 is a very good reliability. So that shows that our, our assessment can reliably measure students' knowledge. Um, but we found that when we were doing our pilot testing, we found that the test was actually quite difficult, that the mean score was less than 9 out of 25. And so what that means is that it would do a good job measuring student knowledge for advanced students, students who are above average 
inability level, but it wouldn't do a good job measuring students that were either average or below average. And so we wanted to get the difficulty more towards the center so we could do a good job measuring students of all ability levels. And so we did some revisions to the test. And with our next round of testing, we found we were able to pull that mean score up to around 11. So it's still a pretty hard test, but that's more in the range we would want it to be to measure student knowledge. So the last part I'm going to talk about is we're going to get deeper into some item response theory. This is one of the standard item response theory models. It's a two per, called the two-parameter logistic model. And what this model allows us to do is it allows us to say, given a student and given a question on the exam, what's the probability that that student will get that question right? So, uh, so this is the logistic curve for question 23 on our exam. So, if, so question 23 is one of the easier questions on the exam. So the student ability is normalized around zero. So a student with ability zero, that means they have exactly average ability. And then a student of ability one means they have one standard deviation above average and two is two standard deviations above average, et cetera. So question 23, you can see just a curve. You can see a student with ability zero has about an 80% chance of getting the question of getting question 23 correct. So that's a, kind of one of the easier questions. Um, and then a student with with ability one standard deviation above is like 95% chance you're going to get it right. But a student with two standard deviations be ability below the mean has only about a 10% right. So we can see that this question is doing a good job measuring student knowledge because a student with higher ability is more likely to get it right. Um, in the logistic curve, you can see, so the theta n is the student ability. So in order to calculate the probability of getting the question right, you take the student ability, subtract off the difficulty of the question, then multiply the, by the discrimination, which is affects the slope of the line, and then you put that through the logistic ability between zero and one. So this is another example question, question seven from the exam. So this question has a lot lower discrimination. And so the slope, is a lot, um, it's a lot less steep. And so you can see a student with, with average ability has about a 65 chance of getting the question right. And the student with two standard deviations above the mean in ability only has about 10% chance higher of getting it right, which Think about right. You think a student with who's that much, who has that much more ability, should have a much higher chance of getting it right. So this is kind of, it's not a bad question, but it's one of the less good questions on the test because you can see the slope is pretty shallow. So, what, what's actually really bad is, is if your question has negative discrimination, you actually have the line moving the opposite direction, having a downward slope, and that would mean that students with higher ability are less likely to get the question right. And when you have that situation, that's that's actually really bad. If you have a question on your test like that, you want to get rid of it. But, but thankfully, that's not a problem we have with any of our questions. All of our questions have positive discrimination. And by ability, are you judging that based on their score on the exam? So the ability, so right. So when you fit an item response theory model, it, it's a generalized linear model. You're fitting a logistic curve for every question on the test. And so... Basically, like it's just like fitting any other statistical model. You use either like you'll use either like max, you'll probably maximum likelihood estimation to estimate which parameters for this model get the best fit. But you're fitting 25 of these models at the same time because you're fitting one for each question. Does that make sense? So, so it's actually the the ability level is very related to the questions that the student got right, but it's not exactly that. It's actually um, it's actually just a parameter fit by a statistical model. So um, this question, question four, is an average difficulty question, because you can see a student with average ability has a 50% chance of getting it right. And if your ability is like a couple standard deviations above the mean, you have a really high chance of getting it right. And if you're a couple below, you have a a really low chance of getting right. So this is a very like middle of the road difficulty question. So, so then this final graph this shows this is the diff this is the 
uh, logistic curves for every question on the test kind of overlaid on each other. So you can see, like I said, all of them have a positive slope. So that's a really good sign. So all of the questions are doing a good job measuring student knowledge. Uh, and you can also see difficulties among the, which is also really good. It means that we can measure student at a range of different abilities. So we can do a good job measuring a student's knowledge if they're a standard deviation above the mean or if they're a standard deviation below. So just for fun, here's another example question. So this is question 23 that we looked at had a really strong positive slope. So it does a really good job differentiating between lower and higher ability. So we read this question. Um, so the question is a lot from sensitive client records in the database. Um, what action should we choose that's most likely to prevent an opposing law firm from reading the records? So the correct answer to this question is, is B, to disconnect your local network completely from the internet. Um, but what what a bunch of students chose, actually more students chose D than the amount of students that chose B, the correct answer. Can you advance the network slide? With... Oh, sorry, which slide? I'm on a slide that says question 20 on the top. I, I'm seeing two parameter logistic model. Uh, Thanks for letting me. Question 23 yet, or is it still? No change. Let me try. Uh, what about now? I just like exited the present. No change for me. Unshare my screen and resharing. Seen blacked out, but maybe it's working. Uh, second, and see if it's. <laughs> Is able to see it yet? Not yet. Now I see. Uh, well, okay. I was just going to ask if anyone had questions while we were waiting for it to show up. Okay, right. So this question, um, the correct answer is the safest, the way, the way to keep it's most safe is just to disconnect your local network completely from the internet. Um, but actually, more students chose option D than the ones who chose B, which is to protect the network with a state of the wall firewall and intrusion detection system, um, which is really interesting because this ties right into what those misconceptions were we talked about earlier, that students think that um, like a software solution is cooler or like a better idea, even if there's actually a physical solution that's more secure. Well, I mean... If you're thinking about availability as well, um, it disconnecting the network does cut off quite a lot of availability if you uh, have like a VPN out to there. So they may have been thinking along those lines as well. Yeah, that's that point. Um, but you but, have to answer the question that's stated. Exactly. Yeah. One of the difficulties in writing these questions is that there often is not a clearly perfect answer, and the student has to choose the best among the given alternatives. Yeah, so another interesting question was a good question we liked was question three. So it's talking about um, sending a, a file over an internet connection. Um, so Alice wants to send a file to Bob over an internet connection. Bob receives a file digitally signed with Alice's private key using a secure digital signature algorithm. 
The file specifies an electronic order to purchase a large number of shares for a new public offering. Contrary to expectation, the value of the stock plummets. Following the incident, Alice denies having signed the purchase order, pointing out that Charlie has been caught forging her signature. And so the question is, choose the most likely explanation for how Charlie forged Alice's signature. Now, as, many, as with many security situations, the correct answer is actually D, that Alice was the weak point and that uh, Charlie received Alice's private key from Alice. Um, but what a lot of students uh, chose was actually option A, which was that um, Ch Charlie uh, copy Alice's dig digital signature from an older purchase order. And so this shows like a fundamental um, misunderstanding about how digital signatures work. Um, and one thing students will do is, one thing that's been shown in the research literature that students will do is they'll use analogies that don't really work. Like when you're teaching students Boolean logic, they'll often think that the if statement in Boolean logic means the same thing as it does in programming. Uh, but it's not really the same thing. And so likewise, students kind of think that like if it was a physical signature, you could copy it, but that's just not how digital signatures work. Um, but students uh, were confused by that. So kind of one of the last item response theory measurements we want to look at is these things called item information curves. So the item information curves, uh, are you guys seeing the information graphs now? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay, good, good. One thing that the item information curves help us to understand how much information about student knowledge do the different questions give us. And it also they also help us kind of understand how much error there is in measuring student knowledge. Um, so on the left, curves for individual test items. So you can see these ones with these really big peaks are, are questions that give us a lot of information about student knowledge. And the more almost straight lines are ones that don't give us very much information. But you can see that all of all of the information curves for the whole test are concave down. So they have an upward slope and then they go down again. Uh, you actually can have test questions that give negative information. They like curve down and back up. Uh, and if you have a question like that, you really want to get rid of it because it means you're actually you actually know less about the student's knowledge if you ask them that question. But thankfully, none of the questions on, on the CCI are like that. They all give us good information about student knowledge. And so on the right, we have the test information function, which gives the information for the entire test. Um, and so the amount of information we can get about a student depends on where their ability level is. So you can see we get the most information about students who are kind of just above average. And that's because the CCI is a pretty hard test, like we mentioned. Um, but then we still get pretty good information about students kind of one or two standard deviations to either side. When a student gets too far out, then we just can't measure their ability uh, very well because if they have like less than two standard deviations below the mean ability level, they're all just going to get zero. So it's kind of hard to differentiate. And same thing, uh, if students have two standard deviations above the mean ability level, um, then they're all going to get perfect scores. And so we, we can't really tell what's different about them. So. So this kind of gives a like sense of what the limits are of the exam. So we can do a really good job measuring student knowledge with this exam, um, you know, within about one and a half standard deviations of the mean with student ability. Um, and so kind of the conclusion of this whole statistical, st um, you know, modeling of the student scores is uh, that the CCI is actually a really very good assessment of students for students who have taken a single cybersecurity course. And so uh, based on this, we know that this is a good measurement tool and that we should be using it for research to test different teaching methodologies against one another. Um, and so kind of some of our future work that we're planning on doing is, so we want to, um, sorry, someone's waving at me. Uh, we want to collect some more expert feedback for the cybersecurity curriculum assessment, which is that next test we want to develop for students who have completed an entire court for an entire degree program. Um, and we want to do testing of the that next test that we're working on developing. And then the other thing we want to do is we want to begin evaluating instructional strategies using the CCI because we've demonstrated now that it's that it's a good assessment. And so it can now be used as a measuring tool to do scientific research and test different teaching strategies against one another. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Is there any questions?
You could also write your, your questions in the chat window. Oh, okay. Let me switch back over. Hey, hey Seth, this is Andrew Slack. is a really interesting uh, presentation. I have a, do you, is there a future work to develop an assessment for more technically challenging skills? Like how do you assess someone's ability or knowledge of doing reverse engineering or vulnerability research or binary exploitation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the question you have to ask is like, how 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 are you going to measure those those skills? So, um, right. So the cybersecurity curricula, sorry, the the uh, curriculum assessment, which is the next exam we're developing, is meant to be um, given to students who have finished like a whole degree course. So it's going to like cover some of the same topics, but advanced but it's still a multiple choice test. So it's still measuring conceptual understanding. Um, it's, it's a lot harder to create um, like validated assessments for like, can you do a certain thing? Like, um, so yeah, like, I don't know, like how would you go about measuring those things? Do you think? It, my thought was through CTFs, like develop CTF challenges and apply the uh, analysis that you did here somehow mm. to those. Yeah, that's and then you can... That's a really interesting idea. Um, to my knowledge, no one's done that. So there's open research for you. Nice. Yeah. No, I, one of the things that's hard is, so I forgot to mention this in the presentation, but in order to do item response theory analysis, you need quite a lot of, you need quite a lot of responses. So in order to do an analysis like this, you'd need like maybe 10 or 15 capture the flag challenges, and you'd need about 300 people to do all of them. And then you could do an analysis like this. Okay, yeah, there's some that are open source that we could have the results for, perhaps. Yeah, so, so it takes quite a lot of data, but if you could do that, that'd actually be super cool. Our, our group is not planning to develop more specialized tests, but rather what we would like to do is to um, apply the tests that we have to compare educational strategies. Uh, uh, this is Donna Rajinsky. I have uh, a question. Uh, uh -huh. So we're working on a, a project right now um, in the manufacturing industry. Security uh, concepts inventory to um, assess uh, students' knowledge based on taking. Uh, uh, two courses or a basic course and then a follow on course. And these would be uh, people in the workforce um, in manufacturing wanting to learn um, skills in, in cybersecurity, which is a critical uh, area for the country right now. And to use the concepts um, uh, inventory that exists, the idea that we're um, thinking about is to, in order to create these to be meaningful in a, in a manufacturing environment, would be mm. to create scenarios. In other words, keep the questions because the, the baseline knowledge that we want the students to obtain is, is uh, defined by the question set, 25 question set. That, that yeah, been, yeah. But we're thinking that changing the scenarios to put it in context to enable the students to relate more specifically uh, to the content and the materials being taught mm. be the way to, to uh, most um, efficiently uh, um, apply this, the inventory. So we yeah. were thinking about looking at and doing research on, and I've already begun to do this, on the types of um, uh, incidences that have been uh, occurred and have been uh, documented and are, are published through like Verizon uh, uh, cyber threat yeah. and such to extract um, scenarios and build that. And I wanted to get an assessment, at least based on the work you've done to date with with the the concepts inventory. How how difficult do you think that would be to modify the scenarios and and mm -hmm. how long would it take? to to do that 
um, so that I can get an assessment of that relative to when we plan to actually run the first mm -hmm. course in January. That's a, that's a really good question. So one of the things that's actually very surprising in education research uh, is that the wording of questions can have a huge effect on how well students are able to answer them or not. So the analysis that we've done shows that with the exact questions that we have, um, with the exact questions that we have, we have some statistical guarantees that they do a good job measuring student knowledge. Um, so like you can ask Alan, um, like when we were developing these questions, we found that there were certain questions that were like almost impossible for students to answer correctly. Then we made some tiny wording change that like you would think wouldn't make a big difference, but it made a huge difference. And then a lot of students were able to answer it correctly. Um, so um, if you take the questions that we've developed and you start modifying them, unfortunately you kind of lose those guarantees that they're gonna be a good measurement. Um, but you can still revalidate them. So if you're going to change them, you'd probably want to run some statistical tests on your own afterwards to make sure they're showing knowledge correctly. Um, but you could definitely take some of the lessons we learned. Like if you read some of the papers that this team, our team has published in the past, um, we talk about um, some of the different ways we worded questions that helped them be good questions. And you could kind of try to use that as you make your modifications to try to make your modifications as like safe as possible. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. we, we have an invited paper in the um, proceedings of the National Cybersecurity Summit 2020, which mm -hmm. describes our experiences and lessons learned with this project. So mm -hmm. we'd recommend that paper. Um, uh, for me, it's been a very humbling experience. It's very <laughs> difficult to generate um, good multiple choice questions. I think it is possible to do so, but it's not an easy task. And we think it's best done in um, an interactive discussion with about four or five people. Um, this is, uh, I would estimate it, it takes a significant number of hours per question, like um, 10 to 20 hours per question and a significant cost um, uh, for everything involved. Um, so the question is composed of three elements, as I understand it. You have the scenario, yeah, the STEM, right. and the testers. Uh, so if we focus strictly to the scenario, do you think that's dangerous enough to mess up the, um, the validity of the question and response? Good question. Yes. I mean, like, with, yeah. So with with education research and psychology research, it's like I said, it's 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 incredibly surprising how very small changes can have a huge effect on on the way students respond. Um, and so, yeah, you you definitely you lose the guarantees. Um, I, I would add that there are some special aspects of cybersecurity, like unlike discrete mathematics, where often there's a clearly defined right or wrong answer. In cybersecurity usually the correct answer is a little bit ambiguous. It's, it depends mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Um, and that presents special challenges for making questions. And mm -hmm. it, it, initially we thought that we could um, spin off several questions for each scenario. And most of the time we did not do that because we needed to nail down the details sufficiently to make sure that there was a clearly best answer, even though it was not a perfect answer. So the, we, we spent a lot of time and effort fine tuning the exact specificity in the scenario um, to get the desired results. OK, great. I appreciate that, um, that information and that guidance, because this is one of the ideas we were bouncing around within our, yeah. our project team so is, is an that maybe we need to re revisit that. Well, to be clear, um, if, if you're talking about modifying our questions versus making your own entire test from scratch, it's probably easier to start from something that you know is good. But um, you just still have to realize that you don't, you lose the guarantees that we've shown. Yeah, no, we would be starting with this body of work that you've produced here. And uh, the idea was we were going to have it uh, be more focused to us or, or try to align a little bit more with the industry that of workers uh, so that mm. it would relate um, 
more specifically to the scenarios. Um, but I think that's a good strategy. I, I think it is possible to modify our scenarios and, and that's oh, yes. going to save you a lot of time um, over doing it from scratch, but just just be aware that the details matter very much. Yeah. So, so if you're going to take that approach, you should like after you should then look, oh, was there certain questions that either everyone got wrong or everyone got right? Do I need to reword those so that they do a better job? Uh, like things like that. Yeah. OK, great. Uh, this has been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we also invite um, instructors to um, have their students take the CCI. And if you're interested in doing so, please send us an email. Uh, we have the assessment available online through a tool called Prairie Learn, so it's very easy to do that. Yeah, and if, any, if anyone has any more questions for me or about the exam or about the statistics we did or any, anything, feel free to shoot me an email or send Alan one and have him forward it. I, I can put my, uh, I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you very much, Seth. That, that was a pleasure. It was a very interesting and clear talk. And thanks so much for having me. I appreciate the practice because hopefully I'll be presenting this at a conference in a few months. Um, we'll be um, meeting here again in two weeks. Um, and I'll let you know um, the speaker. Um, I'm expecting it to be uh, a speaker from industry who's going to be talking about uh, the security, especially software security of uh, payment systems. So that, that concludes our meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.